Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you. Uh, good to be uh, here with you today. Boy, stumbled first line right out of the gate, and I'm already getting tongue-tied. You can tell it's the third, uh, third service here. Well, it's been a blessing. Uh, certainly worship the Lord uh, this morning through our songs and through our prayers, through our giving, and look forward to how He's going to continue to bless us as we worship Him through the study of His Word. Now, I hope that you were here at Village Church this past Sunday. It was a very important Sunday in the life and history of our church. If you were here, the one I'm about to share will be a bit of a review for you to help get you uh, uh, caught back up. Uh, if you weren't here, then this will help bring you up to speed with uh, some very important things that we're talking about uh, here at Village Church of Gurney. Last Sunday, we began a four-part series here called Village Vision 2.0. In the first sermon in this series, Pastor Todd shared with us the new purpose statement of Village Church of Gurney. That's not a new purpose, because the essence of what we're talking about here at Village Church, it hasn't changed. But we're simply restating and repackaging our purpose in a way that we hope will make it more memorable for our congregation, and will make it a more useful ministry tool as well. And simply stated, our purpose as a church is to be helping people Follow Jesus more, so that more follow Jesus. Village Church of Gurney is not an either-or church. It's a both-and church. Being a disciple and making disciples, they're both non-negotiables. They're both essentials for any one of us who calls themselves a Christ follower. Following Jesus, more and more following Jesus. We believe this captures the essence of God's plan for our lives as it's revealed to us in the scriptures. Well, last week, Pastor Todd also shared about how we as leadership intend to help you follow Jesus more. It's our life steps strategy. And we've chosen to clarify and expand upon some of the life steps language that we've been using for the past several years in order to help it make, it, make it more clear what we mean by following Jesus more. BCG is in the business of helping people follow Jesus more by growing, connecting, serving, and reaching so that more people will follow Jesus. And the words serving and reaching are new in our life step strategies. We believe these words bring greater focus to what God wants to be doing in our lives and through our lives as he's changing us, as he's transforming us to be people who follow Jesus more. Now we're all a different places on our journey of following Jesus more. Some of us have been following Jesus for longer than others, and some of us have been following Jesus maybe at a faster pace than others, but we want you to know that wherever, wherever you are at on your journey of following Jesus, we are glad that you are here at Village Church of Gurney. We love you. In fact, we love you so much that we don't want you to stay put where you're currently at in that journey of following Jesus. Because we love you as a church enough that we want to come alongside of you, and we want to challenge you, and we want to encourage you, and, and mentor you, and train you, and teach you, and, and help you to become someone who's experiencing God's power at work in your life, and changing you into a person who is increasingly following Jesus more by growing, connecting, serving, and reaching. We think that's the best way to live life. And we want you to be able to share in that. We as a church, we can't live your life for you. We can't follow Jesus more for you. But we can help you follow Jesus more. That's fundamental to why we exist here at Village Church. Our purpose of helping follow Jesus more so that more follow Jesus, that will never change. Yeah, we're stating that purpose differently now than what we once did, but that purpose remains the same. And by the grace of God, it will remain the same for as long as there is a village church of Gurney until Jesus comes back for us as people. But now a purpose statement, that's different than a vision statement. See, our purpose is unchanging for all time, but our vision, it's more, it's more time-bound. And our vision as a church highlights a particular way that we can emphasize for a season of time one particular aspect of our overall purpose as a church. Now, our vision statement, 
It doesn't try and capture every last little aspect and nuance of our vision. It's not meant to be exhaustive. It's not meant to be comprehensive. Our vision statement, it's more intended to be an attention getter. It's more intended to be thought provoking. It's more intended to pique your curiosity. Our vision statement, it's, it's our attempt to just get our foot in the door. And to gain a further hearing with people and then be able to share with them more about what we believe God is calling us to as a church over these next several months and years. And as pastors and ministry directors, we've been thinking and talking and praying about what it is that God wants to emphasize and highlight in the life of Village Church of Gurney over the next several years. And we've shared our sense of God's leading with our elders who have affirmed the direction that we believe we're being called to go. And collectively, as ministry leaders, we have tried to capture in a concise and memorable and thought-provoking way a brief statement that will hopefully just allow us to get our foot in the door and share more with you about the vision that we believe God has called us to. So with that as our backdrop, this is our new vision statement here at Village Church of Gurney. It's people building two-way bridges to the unchurched. Let's say that again. Let's say it together. People building two-way bridges to the unchurched. As we've sought the Lord's leading and direction, we believe that for this next season of the life of Village Church, God is calling us as His people to emphasize like never before, reaching unreached people, reaching unchurched people with the love and truth of Jesus Christ as it's presented in the gospel. And this vision statement of people building two-way bridges to the unchurched, it's our attempt to capture what we believe God wants to do in our congregation so that we as people can be found faithful in fulfilling this calling. Now some of you might be thinking to yourselves as you hear this vision statement, now hang on Brandon, didn't you just get done saying that, that the purpose of Village Church is to help people follow Jesus more by growing, connecting, serving, and reaching? That sounds like you're talking more discipleship language but your vision statement's talking more of evangelism language. You're saying there's a discrepancy here. Well, no, actually, we think that there's not a discrepancy for numerous reasons. First of all, you need to remember that our purpose statement reads, helping people follow Jesus more so that more follow Jesus. Our purpose statement as a church, our purpose as a church, it's about both discipleship and evangelism. And the words so that in that purpose statement mean that if we want to be effective in doing evangelism and helping more follow Jesus, then that means that we have to be about the work of building stronger disciples, of helping people follow Jesus more. That's part of the reason uh, we've actually dropped the word contribute out of our previous life steps language. We, we, We came to realize it was too broad, it was too general of a term. Because what was happening is that Making disciples, as we were assessing the spiritual health of the people of our church, we find that 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 work of reaching others is all too easily just drifting off of our radar. And we believe we need to bring greater focus. We need to bring greater clarity to this. Yes, Village Church will always be a place for helping people to follow Jesus more. But we need to realize that part of following Jesus more includes personally being involved in the work of helping more follow Jesus. Following Jesus more includes being a person who is building two-way bridges to the unchurched. So our vision statement, it highlights one specific aspect of our purpose statement. And for the next several years, we hope and pray that God will make us into a church full of people who are building two-way bridges to the unchurched so that more people are following Jesus than ever before. For the rest of today and for the next two Sundays, we'll be unpacking more of what we mean by this vision statement. People building two-way bridges to the unchurched. And we'll be talking about why we've chosen the specific words in this vision statement. And with the remainder of our time today, we're going to be looking at the first word in that vision statement. The word people. And if you have your Bibles with you, please open them up to the Gospel of Matthew. Go over to chapter 9 in Matthew. We'll be jumping over to chapter 11 in a little bit, but for right now we're going to start in chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 9 through 13. 
When we say in our vision statement that we believe God wants us to be people, building two-way bridges to the unchurched, well, what do we mean by people? Well, the Bible gives us all sorts of instruction and story and an example about the type of people that God wants us to become as we more and more reach out to, reach out to those who aren't yet following Jesus. And one of those stories is found in Matthew chapter 9. It's about Jesus himself. The story starts out this way, beginning in verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now there's no indication of Jesus and Matthew ever having interacted with each other before this. At least nothing that's uh, written down in the scriptures. But Matthew was certainly aware of Jesus' reputation and his miracles, and his teaching by this point in time in Jesus' life and ministry. And so when Jesus encounters Matthew and issues this invitation to Matthew, who's an outcast tax collector, saying, come, follow me, Matthew is so compelled by this calling that he willingly, instantly gets up, he leaves his way of life, and goes off to follow Jesus. And then in verse 10, we see that the first thing Matthew does as a follower of Jesus is to throw a dinner party. Now this must have been some party because the text says that many came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. And the house must have been just packed with people and it was an interesting group of people. Because again, verse 10, it talks about how a lot of Matthew's now former co-workers came. So the house is just full of tax collectors. Picture that. And in addition, there's, there's this eclectic group of people that could just be categorized as sinners. People whose actions have earned them a bad reputation around town, and, and rightly so. So you have this dinner party, and the house is packed with people, and you got tax collectors and prostitutes and all sorts of other ne'er-do-wells in town, and there's Jesus and his disciples right in there in the middle of all of them. And in first century Jewish culture, if you go to someone's house and share a meal with them, you are most definitely identifying yourself with the people you're associating with. And that's what leads us to what happens in verse 11 here. It starts off by saying, when the Pharisees saw this, and as, just, as I was reading that, what were the Pharisees doing hanging around this private dinner party in the first place? I mean, really. It's like they were on, on this reconnaissance mission. It's almost like that they were stalking Jesus, just trying to catch him and doing something that may, they may find questionable or objectionable. But anyway, they, they see Jesus inside this dinner party, and he's hanging around with a sketchy crowd of people. And, and the Pharisees find or create an opportunity at some point in time to ask some of Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. If your teacher was as concerned about remaining ritually pure as he ought to be, if your teacher was so concerned about keeping the law of Moses as he ought to be, well then why does he eat unclean food with unclean people? Well, word of this little exchange gets back to Jesus. And when he hears of this, he says in verse 12, it's not the healthy who need the doctor. It's the sick. And then he goes on in verse 13. He tells his disciples to go and learn or go and discern what this verse from the Old Testament book of Hosea means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's because that Jesus is someone who desires and pursues mercy for undeserving people It's because of that that at the heart of his mission is that he has not come to call the righteous, but he has come to the sinners. Well, this isn't the end of the story. Because apparently Jesus' explanation of things doesn't satisfy the Pharisees. It seems as though after this exchange in Matthew 9, the Pharisees try to tag Jesus with the label of being a friend of sinners in an effort to try and discredit Jesus' life and ministry. How do we know this? Well, Jesus makes reference to this a couple chapters later over in Matthew 11, verse 19. Completely different situation and context here, but in the course of the conversation, Jesus makes reference to the fact that 
He knows the word on the street about him is here is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It's like after this party in Matthew chapter 9 at Matthew's house, it's like the Pharisees tried to get the gossip machine going. You know that wild party that was over at Matthew, a tax collector's house a little while ago? The one where people were stuffing their faces and, and having way too much to drink? The, you know, remember that party where all the tax collectors and all, all the sinners and just all, all, all the people in town you want to hang out with, they're all together in one place? Well, Jesus is right there in the middle of them. Let me tell you something. He's not one of us. He's one of them. He's a friend of sinners. You know, it's interesting that Jesus does nothing to refute that charge of being a friend of sinners. And he shouldn't. Because it, that much of it, it's a true statement. We talk about our vision as a church of being people who build two-way bridges to the unchurched. What do we mean when we say people? Well, first of all, we want to be people who are friends of the unchurched. We want to be people who are friends of people whose sins cause them to be separated from God. Why? Well, that's what Jesus was. And we want to be people who follow Jesus more. We want to become people who, who are becoming more like Jesus. And so if Jesus was a friend of sinners, well then... We ought to be friends of sinners too. Well, it sounds nice in concept, but it can be awful hard to live out in practice sometimes, can't it? And there's the one extreme, certainly, where some Christ followers, uh, they identify with unchurched people so much that there is nothing distinguishing between their lives and the life of an unchurched person. Remember that analogy with the oven and the refrigerator and when, when the door of your life is open? Do you affect your surroundings more like an oven? Or are you affected more by your surroundings like a refrigerator? Well, people whose lives are influenced more by the unchurched people around them, they're, they're like refrigerators. And, and we certainly don't want that to define our lives. But it can if, if we're not careful. That's one extreme. But there's another extreme where it can be hard for us as Christ followers to find common ground with unchurched people to the point that we can call them our friends and vice versa. And we think about the different values that we have compared to unchurched people. And we, we think about the different priorities in life that we have from them. And we're concerned about the influence that their kids might have on our kids if we got to know them too well. It's, it's not that we want to be hostile or antagonistic towards unchurched people, but sometimes it, it just seems easier. It just seems more prudent to keep a safe distance from them. Acquaintances? Well, okay. Friends? Uh-uh. That's kind of what our default setting can be in an extreme if we're not careful. As you think about these two extremes, though, neither of them characterize the life of Jesus. Jesus didn't compromise his holiness and his righteousness one smidgen, even as he was a friend of sinners. I find that amazing. And you know what's also amazing? Is that the spirit of this same Jesus is alive and well within every one of us who calls ourselves a Christ follower. And the Holy Spirit is more than able to make us into people who are like Jesus in this regard. The Holy Spirit is more than able to transform us into people who are friends of sinners. Because of that, our vision for the people of Village Church of Gurney is for God to make us into people who are friends of the unchurched, friends of people who sin separate them from God. That's a God-sized task. But it's God's work to do. As we sang earlier in this service, God is able to do this in our lives. Well, as we seek to be people who build two-way bridges to the unchurched, we not only need to be people who are friends, but we also need to be people who are ambassadors. It's a word we've heard a lot in the news here in the last week, haven't we? The, uh, the tax on our embassy over in Libya. 
We prayed already in the service for the family of Chris Stevens, uh, the U.S. ambassador to Libya who was uh, one of four who uh, lost his life uh, in, those, uh, in those attacks. Obviously, still a very, very, very tenuous, volatile, complicated situation. We need to keep praying about this. As, as Christ followers. But, but in the midst of everything that's swirling around the situation, I found one thing in this story that I think is, is very pertinent for our purposes here today. By, at least by all the accounts that I've seen in the news, Chris Stevens, this is someone who served America well as an ambassador for our country. And one of the best indications of this comes from the comments that were made in tribute to Chris by his counterpart, the Libyan ambassador to the United States. This is what the Libyan ambassador said about Chris Stevens. He said, I must tell the American people that Chris died a hero. He loves Benghazi. That's the city where our embassy was. He loves Benghazi. He loves the people. He talks to them. He eats with them. And he was committed and unfortunately lost his life because of this commitment. Chris Stevens was a fine ambassador. He represented our nation well to the people he came in contact with in that foreign country. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if unchurched people could say similar things about us, the people of Village Church, in terms of how we represent Jesus? Wouldn't it be great if we heard people saying, even behind our backs, yeah, he loves us. She really cares for us. They eat meals with us. They talk with us. He's committed to my family, to, to, to my marriage. There's something appealing about her life. Wouldn't it be amazing if unchurched people were able to say those types of things and were noticing that there was something different about our lives because we're representing Jesus well? Indeed, being an ambassador means accurately representing the one who has sent us. And certainly our lives are an important part of that. But biblically speaking, if we're to be good ambassadors of God, of Jesus, well then there's something essential that also must be at the heart, at the core of our lives as ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 sheds light on this. You see uh, those verses projected on the screen. Let's read these verses out loud together. Can we do that? From, from 2 Corinthians 5. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to become sin itself so that we could be made right with God. God's heart beats for lost people. God's heart beats because he desires for people to be brought into a right relationship with him. And God desires this so much that he sent Jesus to become sin itself and to give his life as a sin offering so that as a gift of grace and mercy, people could be reconciled to God as they place their faith in Jesus. This is good news. And this is a message that we need to speak we need to plead with people. We need to implore people. Come back to God. He's made a way. He's made the only way for it to be possible to be, for you to be made right with God, and it's through Jesus. And it's, as we do this, it is like God is making a personal appeal to these unreached, spiritually lost people through our lives. Now as we speak this message, we need to speak it with discretion and wisdom. We need to speak winsomely. We need to speak with gentleness and respect, like 1 Peter 3 tells us. But we have a message to share. And we need to speak it. In fact, we get to speak it. That's at the heart of being Christ's ambassador. It's making this good news message known. So yes, let's live lives of love towards the unchurched. Let's do acts of service and kindness for the unchurched. Let's share meals together with the unchurched. Let's do life together with the unchurched. In short, let, let's be friends of sinners. And all of these things are great. They're needed. They're necessary. But let's not limit it to just that. In addition to all these things, let's share the message. 
In our VCG missionary life, Anderson was here with us back in March. He shared with us an analogy about how evangelism is like golf. And the process of sharing our faith, and yes, it is a process. Acts of service and compassion and kindness and friendship. It's kind of like using our driver and our irons. We're just trying to get the ball off the tee and onto the fairway and get, get it closer to the hole. But if you play golf, you know that you don't want to just settle for having the ball on the fairway or on the green. Uh, the goal is to get that little white ball into the hole. And when your golf ball finally gets on the green, as it's getting in proximity to the hole, the best club to use to get the ball in the hole is your putter. Well, in life's analogy, speaking the gospel to people in conversation and dialogue, it's like using that putter. Because our ultimate desire is to see people ultimately respond to the message of the gospel in a way that will bring them into a right relationship with God. And so being an ambassador of Christ, representing Jesus as fully as possible to people, has to include speaking the gospel with them. And as we, the people of Village Church, become people who more and more are building two-way bridges to the unchurched, God will use us to speak the gospel message to people who, who desperately need to hear of the hope that can only be found in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. With our vision, we need to be people who are friends. We need to be people who are ambassadors. And third and finally, we need to be people who are sacrificial. Again, our example here is Jesus himself. So we go back into Matthew's gospel over in chapter 20. There was a situation where Jesus was trying to settle a squabble among his disciples. Many of you may be familiar with the story. James and John were angling for a place of prominence in Jesus' kingdom, and, and the other ten disciples were just really bent out of shape about this. And Jesus, as he so often had to do with his disciples, and you know, let's be honest, as he so often does with us as well, reorients their perspective on what greatness is all about. And Jesus said to them, beginning in verse 26, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We want to follow Jesus more, purpose statement language. It means that we will grow in being servants of others. But sometimes being a servant of others comes at a personal cost to us. Now there is no greater act of sacrificial service that's ever happened than what Jesus himself did. I mean, by leaving the splendor and the glory of heaven to come and live on earth as a human being and then to give his life on the cross as a ransom that would make it possible for people's sins to be forgiven, we can never, ever, ever, ever top Jesus when it comes to sacrificial service. Not even close. But we can't follow his example. We can find ways to set aside our own comfort. We can find ways to set aside our own wants and needs so that we can prioritize meeting the needs of other people in general, but even specifically meeting the needs of spiritually lost people. As we seek to become a church full of people who are building two-way bridges to the unchurched, it will mean make, making personal sacrifices. There will be a personal cost involved, but as we take those steps of faith and obedience we will experience God doing things in our lives and through our lives that we never dreamed were possible before. We had a great example of this happening over the summer as a few people from Village Church tried to take a step of building a two-way bridge to the unchurched people in their neighborhood. I want to invite Vet Brandis, uh, one of those people from our church, to come forward. And uh, Vet's going to share with us some of the story about not just what happened in her neighborhood, but also what it was like for her to personally take some steps of faith and sacrifice. Vet, thanks for sharing with us today. My name is Yvette Brandis, and I have believed in God all my life. I made it a personal relationship 33 years ago. I'm not what you would call an extrovert by any means. Walking into a room full of strangers or speaking to a large group is not something that I'm comfortable with. At some point a few years ago, I took a look around me and realized I had created a very nice comfort zone. And I was very content to stay in it at all costs. 
I work with Christians, I work here at the church, and all of my close friends were Christians. With the exception of some of my relatives, I rarely rubbed shoulders with unbelievers. A few years ago, I started sensing that God wasn't so comfortable with my comfort zone. I could tell he wanted to put me in situations that would stretch me. Some of the changes were easy, like starting a book club with women of all different backgrounds. And some of the changes were a little more challenging, like joining a service organization where I knew only two people in the club. It's been six years since I first joined, and I now feel very comfortable with this new group of friends, volunteering at such things as Salad in the Park and Ridfest, both fundraisers for local nonprofits that help support prevention of child abuse. About this time last year, my husband and I received an invitation from Pastor Todd to join a Go Project group. We had no idea what it was all about. We're very busy between work and church groups, and we're not, uh, we, weren't, we were not looking to participate in anything new. But once again, I felt God nudging me to, think, to not think too hard about it, to just say yes to the invitation. We found out later that after years of prayer and planning, the pastors of 12 local churches were finally ready to launch their program in Gurney. We were assigned to a pilot group in our neighborhood consisting of about four couples who attend three different churches in Gurney. We knew only one of these couples. Over the course of about eight months, we met a handful, we met a handful of times going through the GO Project material and watching the videos that serve as teaching tools. What we learned is that these local pastors have a vision not just for their church families, but for the entire community of Gurney. They see us as a church of Gurney that consists of many Christian churches. We are allies in a joint effort of trying to, in the short run, make relevant personal contact with every household in Gurney so that in the long run, we can use these relationships to introduce Jesus to those who yet don't yet know him. But back to the introvert side of me. I have never felt comfortable sharing my faith with someone that I don't know very well. I have the gift, gift of helps, so I always try to rely on my behind the scenes efforts to hopefully get the message across that I love the Lord and that's why I serve. But the Go Project had what felt to me a new approach. Just start, their approach was to just start to get to know people around me, enter into their worlds, find out what they do for a living, what they enjoy doing when they're not working, what their family life is like. In other words, start a friendship. We've lived in the same neighborhood for about 20 years, and I know only a handful of neighbors, mo most of them just very casually. I felt silly starting on a journey to meet my neighbors after 20 years of keeping to myself. But in our Go Project group, we realized that most people are in the same boat. We're all very busy. We all feel that we don't have time for the friends we have, much less for the friends we don't have. And life has been going along fine with the invisible fences that we've built up in our neighborhood. But our Go Project group decided to forge ahead together and try some of the things suggested in the Go Project materials. It was amazing how much stronger we felt as a group attempting these challenges together rather than attempting them on our own. Our neighborhood consists of about 50 households. We decided to plan a neighborhood picnic earlier this summer, something that had never been done in the 20 years that, since we've been living there. One of the other Go Project uh, couples, Don and Judy Henderson, hand-delivered the picnic invitations to each of the households. We put up reminder signs in the neighborhood for a few days in advance. We had no idea how many people would show up. We moved forward against our fears that we'd be the only ones there. We were encouraged by the number of people praying for our event. Our picnic was in June, the same month that the GO Project hosted a 24-7 prayer room not very far from our neighborhood. I could really sense God's presence as we went about preparing for our guests. We set up a bounce house, volleyball nets, tables, chairs, food, lots of food. We chose a Wednesday night hoping that most people would be around during the week as opposed to the we a weekend in the summer. We had name tags and asked everyone to write their name and address on the tags so that we'd have a sense of where they lived in the neighborhood. We also had a clipboard where we asked for their phone number and email address. Starting at around 5 o'clock, people started arriving. Of the 50 households in our neighborhood, we figured that about 48 of them were represented. The night was a huge success. It was amazing how friendly everybody was and how eager they were to meet e each other. 
In the course of the evening, I overheard conversations of people planning bike rides, people realizing that they were in the same class in high school together years ago, people finding out that they worked in similar fields of work. One of the couples offered to compile a neighborhood directory. A few days after the picnic, I started receiving thank you notes from, someone, from some of those who had attended. Each one expressed such an appreciation to us for hosting the picnic and bringing the neighbors together. They want to keep this going and offered to plan the next one. An interesting thing that I've noticed since that night in June when we invite, invited our neighbors together, what had been a rather unfriendly neighborhood has now become friendlier. People have been smiling and waving in our comings and goings. I've seen neighbors helping each other with projects. We now have a directory that not only helps us remember our neighbors' names, but also gives us a phone number or an email should we need to call one of them. Planning and hosting this event might not seem like a big deal to some of you, but it was to us. We really went out on a limb. We left our comfort zone, and we risked being rejected. But having taken these steps of obedience, we are now in a better position to know when, people, when those people who live near us might need a helping hand, a listening ear, and a word of prayer. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yvette, not only for uh, sharing that uh, testimony with us, but uh, thank you for your willingness to follow the Lord's leading in this. You and all the others who helped to initiate this, you're, you're an example to us all in that regard. What a great first step in building that type of a two-way bridge to the people in your neighborhood. And I, um, I, I know it wasn't easy for you. I know I've had a chance to talk with you just even personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and well, isn't it great just to see what God did? And, and my hope and prayer for you and for Ed and for Don and Judy and the others in your neighborhood that, that maybe it's going to be months from now, maybe it's going to be years from now, but that through those relationships that have been kindled through this neighborhood picnic, that someday you'll have the opportunity to lead many of your neighbors into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, Yvette and her neighbors, they could have played it safe. But they didn't. They sacrificed to go after something that they felt like the Lord was leading them to do. Now, there are a dozen or more reasons. and they, they were defensible reasons. They were respectable reasons why she and all the others, they could have just decided to just let this one slide. Keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. But they didn't. Instead, they followed Jesus more in faith, in obedience, in sacrifice, so that someday, Lord willing, more of their neighbors would follow Jesus. These people took a step of building a two-way bridge to their unchurched neighbors. And I hope not only that I'll get to meet some of them here at Village Church someday, I hope that I'll be able to spend eternity with them, some of them in heaven someday. Folks, the stakes are infinitely high here. People's eternal destinies are at stake. God loves lost people. And he wants them to be in a right relationship with him. And he wants them to worship him and honor him and delight in him. God wants them to experience the richness of all of his blessings in their lives. And if the eternal destinies of people matter that much to God, then we want the etern eternal destinies of people to matter that much to us as well. One final comment about our vision statement here this morning. You notice that our vision in our vision statement, we talk about people building two-way bridges to the unchurched. Our vision statement says people. It doesn't say events that build two-way bridges to the unchurched. It doesn't talk about programs that build two-way bridges to the unchurched. It doesn't talk about ministries that build two-way bridges to the unchurched. It talks about people. Now don't get me wrong, Village Church will continue, as we always have, to offer events and programs and ministries that will help more people follow Jesus. But that's not what that, what's at the heart of our vision. Our vision is to help people build these two-way bridges to the unchurched. Our vision is not about the institution of the church. Our vision is about the people of the church. 
It's about you and me. It's about all of us. It's not just about the leaders. It's not just about those with a unique gift mix or personality traits or whatever else. It's about each and every one of us building these two-way bridges to the people that we rub shoulders with in everyday life. This is a God-sized vision. And to be honest, we're not completely there right now. Oh, I give thanks for the ways that people are already living this out uh, in their, their lives, in their neighborhoods, their places of work, and we look forward to sharing more of those stories with you here in the weeks and months to come. But, but as we've assessed the, the spiritual health of our church as leaders, we'd have to say if we were to be uh, you candid, this doesn't describe the present tense of our church. But we believe by faith it will describe our future tense. And there's a lot that we all need to learn. There's a lot of ways we're all going to have to grow in this. And you know, we're probably going to make some mistakes along the way too. But we believe that God is able to make us, to change us into the type of people who are his tools and instruments who help more people follow Jesus. This is where we're going as a church. And I hope that you are eager to experience God working in your life and through your life and the journey that lies ahead of us. How will God use you to build two-way bridges to the unchurched people in your life? Let's pray. Lord, as I, I think about this uh, vision not just from the point of view of uh, being a, a pastor in this church, but, but just as a, uh, as a Christ follower. As I think about this vision, I'm excited, and yet at the same time, I have a real deer-in-the-headlight sensation going on. This, this, is, this is way, way bigger than us. But we believe that by faith, this is where you are leading and so we would ask, God, that you would begin within the people of Village Church of Gurney a new work, a deeper work, that you would use us as people like never before to be involved in sharing the good news message of the gospel through our words and through our actions with the unchurched people that we share life with. And we would be so bold to ask God that there would be hundreds, maybe even thousands of people that you would bring to yourself in this community through the people of Village Church and certainly through our friends and allies at other area churches. God, we don't know what the future looks like, but we are looking forward to seeing what you are going to do because we believe your word instructs us to be about this work. May your spirit and your word guide us and empower us for the work that does lie ahead. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to wrap up today with a song that's uh, new to our worship services here at Village Church, although many of you might be familiar with it uh, from other settings. This is a song called God of This City. We believe that God has great things in store for this city and for the surrounding community. And these may be things that, that we have never seen before in this area. And we believe that God wants to use us as his people right here at Village Church to be a key part of that work. So as you sing this song this morning, as we conclude this worship service, make the words of this song your prayer. Make the words of this song your declaration that you want to see God make this vision a reality in your life and in the lives of others.